Uh, I've had a long uh, and uh, continuing interest uh, in the subject of uh, global warming and climate change. It's my great pleasure, and very great pleasure, uh, to welcome uh, Professor Chris Arapley here tonight. Uh, Chris is a professor of climate science at uh, UCL, University College London. Uh, he's also chair of the UCL Policy Commission on the Communication of Climate Science. <coughs> and in addition, he chairs the London Climate Change Partnership, which seeks to ensure that this great city that we're in is as, pre is as prepared as it can be uh, for the various impacts of climate change uh, in, the, uh, in the years ahead. Now, I'm not going to go through all of Chris's many achievements and uh, his long and distinguished uh, career, uh, but just a few sort of excerpted uh, points. Um, his early work was devoted to developing and utilizing space-borne instruments to study the cosmos, uh, the sun, and the earth, uh, which means that tonight amongst us we really do have a, a rocket scientist. Uh, Chris was then a director of the British Antarctic uh, Survey between 1998 and 2007, and after that he was director of the Science Museum between 2007 and 2010. One measure of his scientific stature is that in 2008 he was awarded the very prestigious Edinburgh Science Medal for, and I quote, professional achievements judged to have made a significant contribution to the well-being of humanity. In addition to his commitment to understanding and adapting to the impacts of climate change, more recently, he's focused on the public understanding of climate change and the role of scientists in communicating both with the public and with policymakers. And in this context, and this also says something about his uh, demographic status. He is the co-author of uh, a little green book. He's got a copy over here and I've got a copy over there. A little green book that many of you will be familiar with. Uh, co-author of 2071, The World Will Leave Our Grandchildren. A play uh, which was staged at the Royal Court Theatre here in London and uh, in which he was the, uh, the sole uh, actor. Uh, related to this, it's on this sort of focus on engaging with policymakers and the public that informs Chris' talk with us tonight. Anyhow, uh, I have been instructed to say that for the Twitter users amongst you, the hashtag for today's event is LSE Rapley. Uh, I would ask everyone to please put on your phones on silent so as to not disrupt the talk. And uh, the event is also being recorded and provided there are no technical glitches, uh, a podcast will become uh, available. Uh, as usual, there'll be a chance to put questions to Chris uh, after the lecture. However, we have to keep, uh, come to a close by 8 p.m. Uh, now, however, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Chris to deliver his lecture on communicating climate change, why so toxic? Chris. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming. Can you all hear me uh, well enough? Is the sound on? Hello, hello. Is it okay? Okay. Some people are shaking their heads. Okay, well, I'm told it's on. Oh, there we are. I think I, that sounds a bit better. Um, um, I want to start um, with a couple of, um, couple of observations. Um, one is uh, that made by Alexander Nix, uh, the uh, chief executive of the uh, company Cambridge Analytica, um, <coughs> where he said, uh, it doesn't have to be true, it just has to be believed. And this was the principle that Cambridge Analytica used to swing elections around the world. Uh, uh, let's not get into which ones. <clears throat> so, uh, so that's uh, an interesting uh, thought, isn't it? And then there's a second observation by um, Yale um, uh, psychology uh, professor and communications professor, Dan Kahan, um, who says, what you believe about climate change doesn't reflect what you know. It reflects who you are. So 
Those are the two statements that are sort of a little prologue uh, to this lecture, and we'll come back to them later. So this is the object of study, uh, our planet Earth. It's a slightly unusual picture of it. You know, more often you see that glorious um, Apollo 17 uh, picture, the, the blue marble. Um, but I've chosen a picture that's in the thermal, taken in the thermal infrared. So you're looking at the heat radiation which is escaping from the planet into space, and the couple of red rings around the outside just sort of indicate the loss of that, uh, that heat energy. And, of course, um, what the planet is trying to do is radiate away uh, the same amount of energy that it's receiving from the sun. So it's intercepting heat and light from the sun. That energy gets moved around by the, the fluids, the ocean and the atmosphere, and then it radiates uh, the stuff away. And, and uh, over uh, the whole history of the planet, to quite a large number of decimal places, on average, uh, those two, uh, the difference between those two energy fluxes has been equal. Um, but I checked uh, this morning, and uh, out there in the, uh, in the global atmosphere, um, the current content uh, of carbon dioxide is 405.89 parts per million, or at least it was yesterday. I uh, don't know what it is today. It would be about the same. Earlier this year, it peaked out at about 410. Um, and one could say we are privileged, but it's a sort of slightly ironic way of expressing it. We're, we're privileged to be the first human beings uh, to breathe an atmosphere that has that much um, CO2 in it. A, a, an open natural atmosphere is probably more CO2 in here because we're all exhaling. Um, but uh, this is the first time in the history of the human race. And in fact, in, in many lectures over the years, one said it's certainly the first time in 850,000 years that the uh, carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere has been up that high because we can um, measure uh, the content in the bubbles that are trapped in uh, Antarctic ice cores, and they go back 850,000 years. So we've got measurements that tell us that this is true. Um, but we have other proxy measurements that allow us to say probably 3 million years um, ago, um, we, we get back to an era where the carbon dioxide content may have been at about this level. But in fact, um, even today, although I can't track down the actual paper, but the Twitter sphere is buzzing around it, um, there's a new publication um, that demonstrates uh, you, through proxy measures that this is the first time for 15 million years um, that we've had this loading of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And, and you all know the story, more or less, the reason why it's important. If there were no greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, the surface of the Earth would be at minus 15 degrees centigrade. It would be frozen over. We wouldn't be here. Um, there's a 30-degree temperature gradient across the atmosphere because of these very small quantities of trace gases, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and a few others. And so if you elevate um, one of those concentrations, as we have done by at least 100 parts uh, per million since uh, um, the industrial era, um, then you don't have to be um, much of a physicist to say, well, um, you know, that's surely going to make the um, temperature uh, uh, difference across the atmosphere, that gradient, a little bit bigger. Um, and uh, we see that the, the atmosphere uh, has warmed up by about a degree or so, and uh, much more detailed um, uh, calculations and computations say that the intuition is, uh, is valid. So uh, as a physicist, uh, you know, people talk about temperature, global warming, climate change, and so on. But the most basic thing is that we have upset the energy balance of the planet. At present, the planet is accumulating um, more energy than it's radiating into space. And it's as if every single person on the planet had 21 kilowatt kettles uh, and they were boiling uh, water constantly throughout the year. That's the amount of energy that's going in. And 94% of that energy is going into the ocean. We don't actually live in the ocean, so we're not really aware of it. But the ocean connects to the atmosphere. The atmosphere gets a couple of percent. The ice sheets get a couple of percent. Land gets a couple of percent. And so that's how the energy is distributed. And it sort of swirls around between the two. Um, but really, the best measure of this uh, energy accumulation is the rate at which the ocean is expanding, um, helped a little by the addition of, of water from melting ice. So we've upset the energy balance of the planet. And so uh, as the uh, energy accumulates, there are consequences. First of all, the world warms, um, the ocean, the atmosphere, the ice, and so on. Ice melts as well. Ice and snow melt. Sea levels rise. As I say, the, the water expands. 
the ocean and atmosphere circulation patterns change. Um, the ocean, I said the fluids distribute the um, energy around. More energy comes in at the equator than at the poles, but when it leaves the planet, it's more evenly distributed, and that's because the ocean and atmosphere move this uh, stuff around. And in doing so, they carry water vapor and drop precipitation and so on. And if you, uh, if you uh, allow the poles to warm up a bit and they, they react more strongly than the equatorial areas, then you change the circulation of the fluids. Um, the water cycle accelerates because a warmer atmosphere can carry uh, more moisture, 7% for every degree centigrade. Extreme weather events increase through a variety of processes, either in intensity or in some cases in frequency. Uh, certainly heavy precipitation events increase both in intensity and in frequency. Uh, ecosystems respond. Ecosystems are responding to the water cycle and uh, clouds, and uh, if you change those, they will uh, react. And temperature, it, it, marine ecosystems are moving very rapidly um, poleward. Um, and if ecosystems respond, food and water supplies are affected. Uh, the direct impacts of climate change uh, affect infrastructure. Uh, it either requires uh, upgrading or is directly damaged. Um, all of this has impacts on economic and political stability. And so through this um, set of uh, consequences, people and species are impacted. And although I've drawn it as a sort of linear set of things, it's not at all. I mean, all of these things interact with each other in a complicated um, interactive system. Um, but nevertheless, that's the, that's the uh, set of consequences. And that's why um, so many of us have uh, felt for a long time, some for 50 years, um, that this is an issue of considerable uh, importance for humanity to confront. Because um, we're, uh, imp we have a global system of infrastructure and agriculture and economics and uh, trade, um, but it's imperfectly adapted even to the climate system that we inherited. Um, so uh, wildfires in Portugal, uh, Hurricane Ophelia in Ireland, Cumberland a couple of years ago, fires in California, you, you, you will routinely see little glimpses of um, the way that the um, weather systems, extreme weather or extreme weather events, impact the systems that we have built. Those of us that travel on the railways know how um, desperately important leaves are. Um, so the infrastructure that we've built works up to a point, but it, you know, any engineer will design it within, to operate within certain um, weather extreme limits or climatic limits. And so if you push the system out of those limits, and particularly if you make it less stable, um, then there will be consequences. We're imperfectly adapted. And I, I hunted around and I found a figure, <clears throat> an estimate of, um, of uh, additional costs due to climate-related events um, last year, 306 billion. Um, I, I wouldn't stand by it. Uh, it, it. There are lots of different figures and they vary a lot. But what is happening and, and what has been happening over the last couple of years, which is quite important, is that the science of attribution has become much more solid. So, it's, it, so uh, people uh, like Freddie Otto at Oxford and, um, and Peter Stott at the Met Office <coughs> are now able quite quickly to estimate what the likelihood of some extreme event was, you know, a, a drought, a fire, a, an intense uh, weather event um, in the world which has uh, received this additional CO2 and uh, the consequences relative uh, to the counterfactual world which would have been around had we not done that. <clears throat> and by and large, we find that um, probabilities of these events have been increased by maybe a factor two, factor three, sometimes a factor seven. <clears throat> and that science is getting pretty solid now. <clears throat> so the image was of a set of direct consequences, but there are, there are indirect consequences as well. Um, uh, this is a map of uh, showing in these colored blocks the severity of drought uh, in the um, eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean in the three-year period 2007 to 2010. And you can see that over um, the uh, part of Syria, there was a particularly severe drought. It's estimated that it's the sort of one in 500 year or one in 1,000 year event. And the estimate is that it was two to three times more likely as a result of the um, additional carbon dioxide loading and the other things that we've done to the uh, Earth system, changing the land surface and so on, uh, than if we had not, um, not been around. Now, <clears throat> this is the, um, you know, the, the breadbasket of, um, well, the, the, the crucible of, uh, of uh, agriculture. 
Um, this is uh, a, 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 an area where large numbers of people still live um, uh, or lived rural uh, lives. Um, and those three successive uh, serious drought uh, crop failures, um, which uh, extended uh, an already uh, dry period, uh, caused a, um, a billion or so, a million or so people uh, to move from the land into the suburbs of Aleppo and Damascus, where they joined the two million people displaced by the Iraq War, um, and that was part of the uh, kind of highly um, uh, stressful uh, environment in which which led to the the, the, the uh, clampdown by the authorities and the dreadful situation that we have there now. Now, I'm not saying that the drought, um, uh, that climate change caused that, but climate change certainly um, accelerated and amplified that. There are, there are people who argue about how many people were displaced, how many people stayed there. But the security services um, use this as a, um, as a, uh, a, a, you know, a kind of poster child of um, uh, this sort of situation where climate change is making an already unstable situation worse. So you have drought, you have people displaced, you have people, um, if some of those people are added uh, to streams of migration, in this case uh, across the Mediterranean, trying to reach Europe, um, and this is the response uh, of Europe. Um, and so what we're seeing here is climate change contributing to an already very tricky situation. So it's acting as a threat multiplier. Um, and this was foreseen. Uh, there's a um, Department, US Department of Defense report which was published in 2014, so the work was done before that. Um, and it says uh, rising global temperatures, changing precipitation patterns, climbing sea levels, and more extreme weather events will intensify the challenges of global instability, hunger, poverty, and conflict. Now, the only thing I disagree with with the statement is the word will, um, because there is evidence that, that we're already seeing this underway. So that's the sort of grim news, the slightly worrying news. Uh, of course, there is good news. At the end of 2015, the nations of the world, after 30 years, finally um, got their act together, and uh, rather than discussing whether they should do something uh, in a united way about climate change, agreed that they should do something, and even offered um, a set of uh, voluntary uh, commitments, uh, which was certainly a diplomatic triumph. Um, essentially, they agreed a common goal to hold temperatures to well below 2 degrees C relative to pre-industrial, and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5. Um, but a goal is one thing, but you also need a plan. And there's a collective plan uh, to cut anthropogenic emissions and to achieve a balance with removals by sinks in the second half of the 21st century. And a whole load of offers were put on the table that uh, don't actually achieve that, but it's a good start. I spent um, uh, my time at the Science Museum enjoying uh, part of my time uh, ferreting around in the reserve collection as well as the main displays. 96% uh, of the collection is not on display. Um, and you, 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 it's difficult to do that and to fail to come away with the view that human ingenuity is genuinely unbounded on an otherwise finite planet. We are a very, very creative uh, species, and when we need to, we can move quite quickly on technological fixes. Um, and so uh, this is a bit of a race against time, but uh, we see that the prices, uh, the costs of solar PV and wind have plummeted far faster than anybody could have predicted. So the combination of the, uh, the power of the markets and the, um, the power of human ingenuity is already leading us to a future which in principle could be clean, uh, green, and uh, essentially uh, endless because we'll be drawing energy from the sun. Um, so that's the good news, and, and uh, we imagine that that uh, progress will continue to accelerate. Uh, but it won't be sufficient. Um, there's never any shortage of, of reports. You will have heard um, the media coverage a few weeks ago of the IPCC's, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's latest report, um, looking at uh, the distinction between a global warming of one and a half degrees and two degrees. I think to the surprise of many of us, that distinction is rather greater than we had expected, which suggests that the three to four degree world that we're currently on track towards is even more um, concerning. Um, Shell published its uh, uh, sky scenario, which says that if you really, really, really worked very, very hard indeed and stretched a few things like planting 
trees over an area the size of India or Brazil, um, we could just about uh, meet the 1.5 degree guardrail. Um, but to do so requires the greatest collective action in history, um, and we are definitely uh, running out of time. There are, there are many who believe that 1.5 degrees is actually not really realistically. The physics and chemistry um, are feasible, but the, um, the human organisation probably isn't. But uh, we will see how that unfolds. So you, you would think, wouldn't you, that this would be a subject that would be um, on the tip of everybody's tongue. You would think that people would be discussing it in the pub. Um, but uh, here's a, a, uh, here are the results of a um, survey, a poll by the United Nations called My World, um, where uh, at the time I got this data, 9.7 million people from 40 different countries and a big diverse spread were asked uh, to place in order um, a bunch of things, good education, better health care, and so on. And you can see that um, uh, although uh, uh, action taken on climate change is there, it's below phone and internet access and a bunch of other things, um, which is all completely understandable. I mean, if you, want, if you need to, in, you know, in the age of austerity, if you're worried about your job and if you need to put bread on the table for your family, um, I think this is completely understandable. It makes, a, it makes a lot of sense at the individual level. It doesn't make a lot of sense at the collective level, uh, but there we are. That's, that's, the, that's the, what we're confronting. So you have to ask yourself, well, do you know what? The, the climate science community has been studying this for, well, arguably for 100 years, but certainly uh, large numbers for the last 40, 50 years. And, uh, you know, there are good communicators in the climate science community. Um, you know, how is it that somehow or another, this story kind of, you know, is so dead. Why is it a, a, a kind of taboo subject? Um, you know, if you're at a dinner party and somebody turns to you and says, oh, what do you do? And you say, oh, I study climate change. They tend to go, oh, the broccoli's nice, isn't it? So, you know, what, what's going on here? Well, you, you heard um, that early in my career, I, um, I studied the, the cosmos um, and, and used to talk to people about that. Um, and what I would find is that you, one would tap it. It's quite easy to tell that story um, because people are, are curious. Any, most people are curious, particularly about the stars um, and the cosmos. So there's an urge to know, uh, and you tap into that. And if you're good at it, you, you entertain people, you inspire them, you inform them. And then at the end of the lecture, they all walk out of the door um, ideologically and emotionally unchanged because it's, it's, it's ideologically and emotionally neutral subject. Um, but climate change isn't like that. Um, the, the irony is that the better that you tell the story, and you may even have felt a little bit of this when I was giving you those first few slides, um, it, 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 either unconsciously or, con or consciously, um, in your head uh, you, and in your body, you will feel the emotions of anxiety, fear, loss, grief, guilt, and uh, in, one that's particularly damaging, helplessness. You know, what on earth can I do about this? Um, and so that tends to shut people down. And it's interesting because most natural scientists um, uh, in their heads see a red line in front of them over which they will not step, and that is advocacy. Uh, we can tell people facts, we can tell, give people information, we do it, and, and demonstrating that we're as unbiased and balanced as we possibly can be. But the idea that we should step over the line and say, oh, and by the way, I think we probably need a carbon tax, or maybe you should eat less meat, that is a kind of no-no because that's getting into advocacy and that's seen, that's drilled into natural scientists as being something that will undermine their impartiality. And so the standard format of the talk that we offer leaves people feeling helpless because we don't offer them any way out. We tell them what the problem is and then we just back away and say, uh, sorry, that's not our job. Um, secondly, uh, as we speak, there are 3,700 or thereabouts, airliners uh, flying around the, the sky. Uh, this is a, a sort of little uh, map showing uh, a, a kind of typical day. Um, and so this story uh, has another uh, problem, and that is that it threatens deeply established practice, uh, practices and cherished lifestyles. So it's really interesting. I talked to you know, students at UCL who are passionately uh, interested in sustainability and making the world a better place, 
And then you suddenly bump into a barrier. They say, oh, wait a minute, you know, um, uh, I'm not going to give up my hamburger or, you know, I'm definitely going to fly to Iceland this weekend to have a, uh, uh, a great night out. Um, and, and, and why not? You know, this, 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 you know, this can't become a tyranny. It's not our fault. None of us, you know, it's not, n none of us are, are to blame for this. We're all in this together. Um, but as soon as you tell the story, people immediately feel that there's a sort of finger-pointing exercise going on saying, ah, oh, you know, uh, you flew on an airplane, didn't you? You are therefore a bad person. I had um, somebody come up to me after one of my lectures and say, I'm not having you tell me I'm a bad person. And I said, well, I didn't tell you you were a bad person. <laughs> no, I, you did. Uh, um, and then at an even deeper level, um, the, uh, the story challenges strongly held values and power powerful issues of identity. So I've used the uh, Democrat and Republican symbols here. And, and, you know, by and large, human beings, uh, interestingly, do kind of segregate out into two broad worldviews. Um, the Republican worldview uh, values rugged individualism, personal freedom, sees state interference as an insult and an anathema, particularly if it's UN interference, um, and sees regulation, particularly of markets, as something which is uh, reprehensible. Um, and so there is a tendency, and there has been a move, particularly in the States, to uh, avoid the cognitive dissonance of the reality of climate change and these challenges to those deeply held values uh, to say that it's a hoax. So Senator, uh, not Senator Proxmire, I can't remember the guy's name, but um, he'll come back in a second. But the Republicans kind of wear, uh, the Tea Party in particular, wear climate change dismissal as a kind of badge of belonging. Um, and, and once you're in your cult, with your badge of belonging. It's very difficult to shape that. Whereas if you come from, uh, and I've typified it with the Democrats, from, the, uh, from the, a worldview which values community, uh, reducing harm, collaboration, sees that we are the stewards of the planet, that we don't have dominion over it, uh, uh, interested in protecting it uh, for future generations, a sort of ethical view, um, then you can see how this separates people apart. So it challenges strongly held values, powerful issues of identity. Um, I have a particular view on Brexit. I won't tell you what it is. Um, but asking me to um, suck it up and come over is ridiculous. It's like asking somebody who is a dedicated um, uh, religious individual to change religion. You, you have your identity. You have your worldview. And, uh, and you're very unwilling to shape those. And, and we see that in this case. And of course, this isn't, a, this isn't a neutral environment. That's the other thing the climate science community tends to do. And you, you read a lot of publications on it, talk about you know, how do you connect with people in the audience, kind of ignoring the fact that this isn't a kind of vanilla world out there. There are people out there, there are vested interests, and others playing with our heads all the time. Um, and uh, just as in the United States, uh, the, um, the Republican badge of honor is to, um, by and large, reject climate change. That package, uh, in a slightly different way, um, is promulgated here. And so, uh, you know, the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, the Sun um, will uh, package the um, climate change as a fraud, along with all the other stuff that they constantly push at you uh, to shift your views, uh, in this case, uh, about migration. Interesting, isn't it, when you look at a compilation like that, every other day the same message is coming out. And what the psychologists will tell you is that um, the effect of that, even if you reject the idea, is to just reinforce the, the, the biological connections, the neur neuron connections in your head that um, encapsulate that concept. Immigration is bad, climate change is, is not happening. And so even, and, and even if you then offer a, a, a negating sentence, you're actually reinforcing that same concept. So, it, so our heads are constantly being worked on and not just by uh, Alexander Nix. So the upshot of that is that we tend to build barriers around us and um, uh, various flavors of it. So sim negation, simply believing that something is untrue that is true, disavow, kind of accepting it's true, but pushing it somewhere back into the recesses of our unconscious so that we don't have to deal with it, uh, a, a kind of denial where we, we struggle with it but uh, push it away, evasion where we try and ignore it, 
which is what most people do, and it leads to a silence and, and a lack of action. Now, that's not to say that there hasn't been a lot of action. There has been a lot of action, but I'm talking about uh, in, in broader society. Uh, this diagram is by a Norwegian uh, colleague of mine, Per Esken Stockness, whose book, uh, What We Try to Think About When We're Not Trying to Think About Climate Change, is, is well worth reading. So this, this brings us to think, well, you know, it, it, actually, uh, we need to understand what's going on in people's heads, um, because in, in, in the end, this is at the root of our um, issue. So, you know, why have we got a brain, you know, uh, and, and why is it that plants don't have brains? Plants and trees don't have brains um, because they don't need them, because they are literally rooted to the spot, so they don't have to plan anything. Um, they actually have central nervous systems, and I was talking to a forester recently who uh, was trying to persuade me that they even have, they even have communities through their roots. They communicate with each other and, and uh, try and help each other, which sounded a bit strange, but anyway, I can uh, believe anything, I suppose. Um, but they don't need brains because they're not moving around the physical world. And so, I mean, obviously, the first thing that the brain is doing is operating the body. I'm, I'm not thinking about having to move my arms uh, and so on, that's all, or my heart or my lungs. That's all being managed by um, the, the brain and the central nervous system. So at the, at the, at the very base, it operates your body. Um, and, you know, it, it, that's quite sophisticated. I, don't know, I remember an experience, you know, you, you bicycle four miles uh, and you're thinking about things. And at the end of it, you realize that you cannot remember a single uh, piece of evidence from the journey. So your brain has managed you uh, in that, you know, avoiding potholes and stopping for traffic lights and so on. And you weren't even uh, aware of it. So it, it's a pretty efficient system for doing that. Um, and of course, that all part of that is navigating the physical world. And interesting, the, um, <clears throat> as a physicist, the, the response to the physical world needs to be pretty quick. Um, if, if one of these uh, things started to fall over, you know, from a standing start, something can drop 16 feet uh, in the first second. So, um, you know, you need to be able to move quickly. So navigating the physical world um, is not only just a question of planning things, having a model of the world, but also being able to react to it pretty quickly. Um, but even more complex is the social world. And our social world, you know, the reason humans have been so successful is that we have this ability to collaborate, work in social groups, um, and that is a hugely complex task. We're constantly reading other people's facial expressions, responding to their actions and their words, and so the brain is humming. Um, I'm told that um, if you enter a room um, with a group of new people who you haven't met before and you, who you have to interact with, that's when the brain really lights up because it's making dozens of decisions. Uh, do I like that person? Do I trust that one? You know, uh, all sorts of decisions being made. Um, and then if there's, if there's any uh, capacity left over, um, there's time for a bit of reflective thought. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, that if we want to do reflective thought, we try and move ourselves away from these other um, loads on, on the brain. So we, we, we go somewhere quiet uh, where there aren't many people around, um, and that gives us a bit of extra capacity uh, to, um, to handle that. So basically, the, the brain is keeping us alive, um, and, and it's seeking to avoid disadvantage, including you know, both physical and social disadvantage, um, and at the same time, it's trying to seek advantage. Uh, so it's working away um, pretty effectively. Um, and it's, it, it's delivering you meaning in context, and it's delivering it quickly. I don't know what these kids saw, um, but on a time scale short compared with Usain Bolt responding to the starting gun, the arms have come up to protect the chest and the face. The mouth is open to draw in oxygen to energize the muscular system. The eyes have opened in order to give a better a scan of what other dangers might be around, and you see it's happened to all of them instinctively. Um, so uh, we have systems which are processing visual and all other sensory information completely um, uh, without our knowledge and control. They're hidden down uh, in the unconscious, um, but they're there uh, to deliver meaning in context. As a physicist, it took me a long time to realize that they're, they're not there to try and map out a perfect model of the world. That's not what's happening at all. They're delivering you meaning in context. In this case, um, you know, whatever it was uh, caused them all to react the way they did. And Daniel Kahneman, um, uh, if you've read his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, says that uh, uh, tip it likens our brain to being a machine for jumping to conclusions. 
So um, there are, there are uh, physical sensations, uh, you know, our senses are, are driving uh, uh, input into the brain all the time, actually at quite slow bit rates, amazing. And, you know, what we see of the world is mainly constructed in the head, um, but there's enough coming in uh, to keep us aware. Um, and so that's all going into this bit of machinery. Um, and uh, at the same time, there are lots of other factors that are affecting how the machinery is dealing with that. So everything from uh, evolutionary history, individual genetic factors, memories and experiences, emotions and mood, pressure from the social environment, uh, influences from cultural heritage. Um, I took this from Burton's book, A Skeptic's Guide to the Mind. It's a rather nice diagram. So all, all of that framing is in there. Um, which means that uh, you may respond to a particular physical se sensation quite differently um, on one occasion from another. Um, but that's all going on. It's all buzzing away in there. And the output um, is mental sensations, perceptions, associations, and feelings. You know, we feel uh, afraid, happy, uh, worried, um, uh, whatever. Um, and it, the brain is also handling thoughts, and decisions and actions. But as often as not, um, it jumps. Because it's working so fast all the time, that's its normal mode, um, it bypasses the thought stuff and goes from mental sensations to decisions and actions. And um, you know, so when you're on the motorway and the you know, white BMW cuts you up, um, it's probably not a good idea to start flashing your lights and honking at them and racing after them. Um, but as Norma will attest, um, that tends to happen. Uh, if one thought about it, one probably wouldn't do that. So let's just do a little experiment, because uh, I've talked enough for the moment. What I'd like you all to do um, is repeat after me a single, simple word, and your job is to shout it out as loudly as you can, okay? So I will, I will give you the drum beat. <coughs> and, and, and the word is, is... All right, clear your throats. Everybody get ready. <coughs> So the word is cow. So, cow, cow, cow. cow. louder, cow. cow. What the cow? What the cows? All right, stop. What do cows drink? Milk. Ah. Water. Water. <laughs> if I had said to you, if I had said to you, what do cows drink? Think about it. You might have said water. So that's the point, isn't it? Um, but it's an interesting one, isn't it? It's better in a conversation to say something rather than not say something. Um, because uh, you, literally we say, well, they're a bit slow. Um, you know, it seems a very negative thing. So in a conversation, you, you imagine the, the computation that's going on inside your head. So unconsciously, in a conversation, you're thinking, oh, where's this going? Down there, something is going, hmm, what words and ideas might I need next so I can begin to shape them in my throat and mouth so I can respond on the time scale that we're used to in a conversation? And so, you know, and, and, and it's better to say something and then laugh about it if you got it wrong um, or excuse it than not say something. So, so it just illustrates um, that that thoughtful, deliberative style of um, uh, planning and acting is, is, is not the norm. And of course, as you know, children of the Enlightenment, we, we imagine that we're terribly rational. Um, but th that's not the case. And, and I would say that the evidence is that even when we think we're being rational, we are still being affected by all of those things that are on the left-hand side of that diagram. Uh, we still suffer from motivated reasoning and, and all the other things. So we react much more than we think. That's a, that's a pun. We react much more than we think, than we, think we do. Um, now, in addition, we're also highly influenced by those we hold in esteem and whose esteem we seek and whose worldview and values we share. I kind of mentioned it with the um, political divide uh, earlier on, but, but that is the case. And we all tend to gravitate because it's just easier and more comfortable um, to people um, who think and view things like us. And pretty much everyone in this room will, I imagine, uh, have a very similar kind of set of values and worldview. And we are quite different from the population at large. We are, we are not the majority. I, won't, uh, I have had conversations, I've gone out of my way to have conversations with people who hold very different values and worldviews. Um, and it's a quite uh, startling experience 
to understand just how differently uh, they think. Um, yeah, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's different. The other thing um, is that we are cognitive misers. We know much less about things than we realise. Um, so uh, the, the work's been done where you, you go to somebody and say, uh, you know, what do you know about? And they might say, oh, I know about, I don't know, medieval history or opera or something. And you say, on a scale of one to ten, where do you think you are on that? They say, oh, well, I don't know, probably a seven. You say, okay, talk to me for two minutes about it. Uh, and after about a minute and a half, they stumble and go, oh, well, maybe I'm only a three. Um, we all like to think that we know a lot more about stuff than we do. We imagine that we know more about stuff than we do because we probably did at one time, but we've kind of forgotten a lot of it. Um, but actually, it's a good evolutionary tactic not to have to carry too much stuff around because working in social groups, um, we can usually find somebody who is the expert. You know, it's, it's the ultimate division of labor. So, you know, I don't know how to um, make a laptop, um, but lots of other people do, and so I can buy one. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know how to, you know, grow food uh, on large scale, but other people do, and so I get fed. So, so uh, this is sort of generalization of the fact that we don't really need to carry that much stuff around in our heads, just enough to get by. Some people do. Uh, you know, and are experts, and they tend to be our trusted sources. So, uh, so we go to them. Uh, so the combination of these two things, um, uh, that discomfort of having to deal with people whose views and, uh, and uh, behavior that you, you don't really approve of or like, um, causes us to separate out um, into different tribes. And within those tribes, um, there will be uh, you know, wise people, seers, um, who are seen as the font of knowledge on, on various bits of uh, expertise. But by and large, there will be some who lead uh, the thinking of the group and, and some that don't. And, of course, the most extreme form of these are cults. Um, and, uh, but, but to some extent, we are all part of a, um, a cult of one form or another. And then the, the other thing we have to recognize is that we're capable of believing almost anything, or people are. Um, you probably you may have read in the newspapers because it was a good story. Um, people from all over the globe flew to Birmingham uh, to uh, talk about the earth being flat uh, recently. And uh, 80 or so people are convinced that the earth is flat. And um, they have now found each other through the internet. And um, uh, as I say, they've uh, managed to navigate this flat uh, place to get to Birmingham. And... Um, <laughs> But, 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 the, but the point is that, that people can believe in, in more or less anything. And th this has been studied a lot. Uh, Leo Festinger, the, uh, the psychologist in the 50s, uh, was looking at how cults believe in things, how they get to that point. Um, but, you know, we, we all laugh. Um, but it's almost certainly the case that there are things that you and I believe in uh, that uh, are, are part of this pattern. And, and um, the um, book by Burton on feeling certain makes a very powerful case that the link between feeling that you know something, being certain about something, is detached from rational thinking. It's, it's a deep emotion, like anger, fear, and it, it's something that has developed in, in our evolutionary package. Um, and it's, and, and so that's important to understand because it is, it is not connected to rationality, and so rational evidence and argument make very little impact on it. Somebody who really believes something. Uh, there was a, an article recently where somebody who had uh, joined a, um, uh, a cult uh, realized that the cult leader uh, was lying. They, they knew that they were lying, um, and it didn't matter. It, it, they said, it doesn't matter. They're the cult leader. I still believe in them. Uh, you know, so the, the, it, there's a disconnect uh, between the Enlightenment um, deliberative, rational thinking, and, uh, and that. So the trouble is that we all have the Mark 1 brain. Um, and so what are we going to do about it? Well, um, firstly, constant vigilance. You know, we, we, uh, and the Greeks understood this. I mean, people have talked about this for you know, as long as people have written and spoken. Um, but we constantly have to patrol and question ourselves and ask ourselves. It's as if we sort of need to get outside ourselves and say, well, why do I believe that? You know, how did I come to that conclusion? Is it really uh, a rational conclusion? Um, but again, um, Burton makes the case that if, if you have got a flawed machine, which, which is not rational, 
uh, completely and suffers from these faults, even theoretically, it's probably not possible for that machine uh, to detect when it is making errors. Um, and so the scientific method is the other way of doing this. Get other people to scrutinize your statements and your beliefs and your ideas. And that's, that's the power of science. That's, that's the wonder of science, that we, we put our um, evidence out and other people poke away at it, um, uh, vigorously scrutinizing it. And, and in the end, we end up with something which, uh, to the best of our ability, is somewhere near the truth. So the, the various uh, biased assimilations and motivated reasonings and uh, uh, identification of things that fit uh, rather than things that don't uh, kind of get ironed out a little bit by this process. It's, it's imperfect, but it's the best we've got. So that's what we need to do with ourselves uh, and what we believe and what we believe is important and where we focus our efforts. So that's a personal thing, how to do that the best we can. But obviously, e e even if we sort ourselves out, we are not going to address the climate uh, uh, issue on our own. We have to engage others. So um, the question we have to ask ourselves is, who is our audience? What do you want them to do? Not what do you want them to know, because what we've seen is what they know only has a mild effect, on, or may only have a mild effect on what they do. Um, and how can they do it? It's, it's not just, you know, what do you want them to do? You need to help people find a path uh, between A and B. Um, and, and then, of course, there are lots of dimensions to this. So within an audience, um, you will find that there are those who already have an opinion or a position on the subject. Um, and this is uh, from uh, uh, Lizerowitz's um, Six Americas, uh, stuff uh, done at, at Yale. Um, the numbers change a little bit from country to country and time to time. Uh, but by and large, um, on the left, we have those who have their highest belief in global warming, most concerned, most motivated, maybe 15%, maybe 20%. They're labeled alarmed. The concerned, maybe about another 30%. Uh, recognize that it's an issue, you know, maybe uh, people in this audience fall into that, but aren't really too sure what to do about it. Another 30% are kind of, you know, on, on, the, um, uh, on the fence, not, um, uh, not convinced. 7% couldn't care less, disengaged. 11% are doubtful, are skeptical. Uh, and then there are hardcore, sometimes 10, sometimes 20%, who are actively dismissive, who see this as a kind of insult to their values and work hard, um, to, uh, to dismiss it. So if, you, if you're delivering a talk, you better understand who's out there um, because if you've got a, an audience of the dismissives, then you would need to deliver a very different talk than one to the uh, people at the other end. So understanding where people are is important. Most people in this room, but perhaps not all, are probably more towards the left. Uh, but I've talked a bit about values and... Um, uh, been working with people who study values. They're kind of white Cambridge Analytica, if I can put it that way. They've been scraping data on people for years and uh, classifying where people's values lie. And there are uh, broad categories. This is just this is one particular um, uh, categorization. There are others, um, but we need to understand that uh, if we're talking to somebody who uh, rejects, uh, who who is a rugged individualist who rejects the idea even that there is such a thing as society, let's say, um, then you, you've got a different task than if you're dealing with somebody who believes that, the, um, uh, that we should be good stewards of the planet. So I chair um, the uh, commission at UCL on communicating climate science, and we tried to map out you know, what's out there. So you know, climate science community over here, the planet over on the right, climate action, the two red boxes, and by and large, climate action derives from political and business decisions, and um, the general public. The two things are connected. You know, if you come up with a policy that the public uh, won't tolerate, like uh, up until now, um, uh, land-based uh, wind, um, then you can do as much policy making as you like. It, it, it isn't going to work. So this, this is the, the, the basic framework. And you'll notice that for um, businesses and uh, politicians, there's usually a um, intermediary group of people who are analysts, synthesists, uh, and advisors. So the civil service, or in a company, some expert group 
um, who are uh, trying to make sense of the evidence and guide the decision making. Um, it's more complicated than that because there are lots of other actors in here, um, the opponents, the proponents, the media, um, and I put arts, museums, science centres, places that people can go to um, uh, to learn about things. Um, and so there are many, many places if you want to intervene in this uh, public, this societal discussion, there are many places you can intervene. Uh, it's even more co complex because the science community itself consists of individuals, groups, research centres, and so on, right the way through to advisory bodies and what have you. So there are many, many different ways um, that one can intervene in this complex landscape um, to try and energise more climate action at that end by um, more action from the science community on this side. And the work that we're doing in UCL, um, the, the light blue ones have been done, and, and these are other things, little projects that we've got underway uh, where we're trying to intervene in targeted parts of this landscape in ways that will make a material difference. But the, the point is that it's open for anybody to do that. Now, so that's the landscape, but, but then what do you actually do? Well, um, in, in this one idea, and you see it uh, on, the, on the TV and in the radio a lot, that you have a debate. Um, and, and, you know, we're taught, aren't we, that debates are wonderful things, right, from when we were at school, um, that uh, a debate is great. You, you know, you, one side comes up with its uh, proposition and the other oppose it. Um, but you think of, think of what the rules of engagement are. Uh, you're assuming that there is one right answer and that the objective is to find that one and reject the other. It's adversarial, it's about winning, about listening for flaws, picking holes in things, defending your own assumptions, pursuing your own outcome. And, there, and, and the most in, invidious uh, or insidious element of it is that there are asymmetries of engagement. I've been confronted with um, uh, politicians uh, uh, in a discussion about climate change, and they can operate by a completely different set of rules from me. I'm constrained by the rules of my profession, that is, I must be as impartial and honest and blah, blah, blah as I possibly can, N not least because the audience I'm mainly talking to is my, the audience of my colleagues behind me. I cannot lose, cannot risk losing their esteem. So I have to play by particular rules. But your opponent may not, may not need to play by that, those rules. They can use rhetoric. Um, they, can, they can use whatever means they can to try and win the argument. Um, and most of all, um, it's seen as a form of entertainment. You know, when you watch prime ministers question times, if you ever do on the TV, are you really listening to what they're talking about? Well, they're usually not talking about uh, anything um, uh, in any sort of substantive way. You're simply looking, it's a, it's a, a sports match. You're looking to see who wins. So um, this is not a very helpful way of doing things, much as it's, it's promoted as the way, because it pushes people apart. Um, the, the other means of engagement, again, which uh, the Greeks well understood, um, is, a, is dialogue, where you assume that it's, it, which is collaborative, where you assume that other people have pieces of the answer, it's respectful, you try and find common ground, you listen to understand, you explore assumptions, you discover new possibilities, and you seek constructive progress. And the Science Museum's Dana Center was established um, to develop a systemized way of dealing with big controversial issues like genetic modification and nuclear power and so on uh, in a dialogue format. Um, and um, when I was director of the Science Museum, I was absolutely stunned to see that they would take an electronic poll at the beginning of the evening and, and one at the end of the evening. And I saw on a couple of occasions, you know, a, a shift of 80% of the people present being against something to being 80% for something through a process of dialogue, which is something I uh, can guarantee, well, pretty much guarantee you would never get uh, in a debate. People are pushed apart. In that case, people were brought together and were able to make an informed decision. So that is bad. This is good. But the media love this. This is, so when people talk about, um, you know, uh, the media bias of, of always, you know, 10,000 scientists say one thing, they find a um, climate dismisser to say something else. It, it, that, that imbalance is, is one element of it. But it, it's, it's the fact that it's entertainment and it's the fact that there are asymmetries of engagement that, that sort of belittle um, that form of engagement. Now, what about the mode of delivery? I'm, I'm delivering this to you very much in information deficit mode, although you did have your moment. Um, but <laughs> um, 
and, and there's a lot of, uh, there's an enormous amount of angst in the um, science community saying, oh, the information deficit mode is, you know, not the way to deliver things, it always fails. That's a very simplistic view. If you're dealing with a government department or if you're dealing with a business, information deficit is fine because that's what they're set up to deal with. Uh, they don't want to know about the emotions. They want to know what the facts are. That's their job. So there are places where uh, truth speaks to power, information deficit is fine. And, and I would argue that the reason you've come is that it works in, in this situation as well because you are a willing audience. You have volunteer to come here and hear me deliver you a whole load of uh, this stuff. We'll have a Q&A in, in a minute. Um, but human beings, uh, uh, th you know, from early origins, have made sense of the world through narrative and stories. There is evidence that we piece together uh, sense um, of the world through structures in our head which are, are uh, parts of the story. Kahneman um, illustrates this. He, 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 sometimes at the beginning of his lectures, he tells people a very simple story. He says, the story is, if I remember it correctly, uh, Mary spent the day touring the city. When she got home to, uh, or when she got back to her hotel, her purse was missing. And he gives his lecture, and then at the end of it, he asks people to shout out keywords from that story. And you'll get Mary, you'll get city, you'll get purse, and you get pickpocket. And then you say, well, I didn't mention a pickpocket. But in people's heads, to make the story make sense, the idea of a pickpocket is lurking there and they have forgotten that he didn't actually say that. So, so we, we, we react strongly to stories. They need to be engaging, they need to be meaningful, they need to be hopeful, they need to be actionable, and if possible, they need to be experiential. And this is becoming something of a fashion at present. Uh, the Natural Environment Research Council funded a project led by uh, Peter Stott um, and, uh, and his wife uh, that uh, took 20 young researchers from Exeter University and the Met Office and um, turned, uh, offered, it didn't turn them into, it, off, it opened up um, skills and uh, talents that they had in poetry writing, in theatre, in songwriting, uh, and in, in art. Um, uh, and, and this is encapsulated in this little book, but it just completely opened them up to new ways of connecting with people uh, their story. This is new. A uh, lovely little poem uh, from an American poet uh, 20 years ago. Um, if, if the earth were only a few feet in diameter, floating a few feet above a field somewhere, people would come from everywhere to marvel at it. They would declare it as sacred because it was the only one, and they would protect it so that it would not be hurt. The poem goes on a bit, but you see the point. You know, the, the connection between art and science is a very powerful one. Um, at the Science Museum, where people can come and explore at their own pace, a sample what they want to. Um, the uh, atmosphere exhibit that, or gallery that I was involved with uh, uh, when I was director there, um, the idea was to change the way people think, talk, and act about climate change, but its, its purpose was to attract, engage, inform, entertain, um, but let people make up their own minds. Again, the museum learned, has learned over the years the hard way um, that going over that uh, red line of adv advocacy um, is a tricky thing to do, a dangerous thing to do. You may have heard that the BBC, uh, after 10 years or so of, uh, of staying away from the subject, um, will, is uh, at this moment um, in the throes of putting together a blockbuster uh, uh, climate change programme, which will air um, next March. I'm helping them with the, um, with the science background to that. Um, the point is that they have, uh, it's, it's not so experiential, but they have huge outreach, particularly if they sell the uh, program on around the world. Um, and then there's the theatre, uh, which is immersive. I mean, this is a bit theatrical here. So as you, as you heard from Tim a few years ago, I was um, introduced to Katie Mitchell, the um, fantastic um, theatre director. She introduced me to Duncan Macmillan, the amazing um, young playwright. Um, and the three of us, literally drew our talents and experience together, and we wrote the play 2071, which I performed at the Royal Court Theatre uh, and elsewhere. And I'm just going to read you, if you bear with me, I'm looking at the time, I'm trying not to go on too long, um, just read you the, the tail end of it, um, just to give you a sense of how um, this is rather different uh, from the kind of formal uh, scientific papers that I would publish uh, on this subject. So. We're all dependent on energy. Almost everything we do depends upon it. There will be carbon atoms generated by uh, this event that will still be in the air in 2071. 
in the air that my granddaughter will breathe. I, I forgot to say, 2071, because my eldest granddaughter will be the age then that I was when I wrote the play. So it's a way of thinking ahead. Uh, that and all our other carbon dioxide emissions are our legacy. Science cannot say what is right and what is wrong. Science can inform, but it cannot arbitrate, it cannot decide. Science can say that if we burn another half trillion tons of carbon, dioxide, of carbon, the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere will increase by another 100 parts per million, and that will almost certainly lead to a warming of the planet greater than 2 degrees centigrade, resulting in major disruption of the climate system and huge risks for the natural world and, and, and human well-being. But science cannot answer moral questions, value questions. Do we care about the world's poor? Do we care about future generations? Do we see the environment as part of the economy or the economy as part of the environment? The whole point about climate change is that despite having been revealed by science, it's not really an issue about science. It's an issue about what sort of a world we want to live in. The final line is, what kind of a future do we want to create? Now, I'd normally stop there um, and hope that you might um, give me some applause, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, not yet. Whoa, 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 not yet, not yet, not yet. So, so the, the script is in the book. But um, I started with, with a couple of um, statements, and I want to close on them. Um, it doesn't have to be true. It just has to be believed in this strange thing uh, that is us. And what you believe about climate change doesn't reflect what you know. It reflects who you are. And the climate science community has spent enormous amounts of effort trying to help you know more. But actually, uh, our task is much harder than that. The task for everybody is much harder than that. To tackle climate change, we have to change who people are. We have to give them epiphanies. We have to shift their values and their worldview so that they take this subject seriously and do something about it. Thank you. Great stuff, Chris. Uh, I assume this damn thing's still working. Um, so we've got about 20 minutes uh, for uh, questions. Um, if you could uh, say who you are and your affiliation. Um, and Chris would like to take uh, questions in groups of uh, three. Uh, so if you shove up your hand, I'll point at people and someone will run along with a mic. Isn't that what's going to happen? Yeah? Uh, well, why don't we try, try, try here with the... The woman in yellow. Hi, I'm um, Kat Nelson from uh, the Natural History Museum. Previously the Science Museum. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know. um, I've got a question about, you talked about cult, and I was really interested about, you know, what is it that shifts somebody out of their belief system? And, and has that been looked at in relation to actually creating that shift for people out of their belief system who are climate skeptics, climate change skeptics? Yeah. Okay. Um, chap over there? Yeah. I'm just doing it as I see them, so him, <laughs> with a checkered shirt. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Ollie Connor. I work in communications for lots of uh, big brands. Um, and I'm wondering what you see the role of um, brand communication is in this. Um, I'm thinking of a lot of people I know who work in brand communication who are exceptional storytellers and use models of communication that are highly sophisticated and would love to get involved in this type of stuff. However, they're kind of trapped in the kind of world they operate in yeah. and are looking for better connections. Thank okay. you. Hi, I'm Tim Root from Friends of the Earth. Could you tell us your assessment of the performance of organizations like Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, 350.org, how effective or ineffective they are? Okay. Three very good questions. Thank you. Um, if I take Cats uh, first, the, the cults, um, all of the research that's been... It, it's interesting. Uh, I was talking to a psychologist recently, um, and he was saying um, there are too many uh, researchers who've gone into cults 
to try and find out how they work, and they'd never come out again. <laughs> it's true. Uh, and he won't do it. <laughs> um, the uh, Festinger's work uh, in the 50s, where he was looking at the group led by an American woman who thought that aliens were going to come and uh, take them away, um, through to my colleague Krista Mayer at um, King's College, who's produced a lovely documentary called Right Between the Ears, Right Between the Ears, which is about um, believing, uh, having, having a conviction about something. And as I've said, um, all of the, uh, in, if you look at that documentary, when he asks people not how they came to believe in that case that they were going to be raptured on a particular day, that God was going to come and take them off to um, heaven. Um, they, they didn't talk about how they, how they come to that conclusion. They talked about how they felt about it. And they lit up and said, it's perfect. It, it, it fits. There's not a single flaw in it. It makes complete sense. So there's something deeply, deeply visceral about it. And all of the evidence is that uh, as you present evidence that they are wrong, like God didn't turn up at midnight and rapture them when the aliens didn't arrive, um, the dissonance is so severe that those who've made major intellectual, social, and particularly, uh, well, and financial or, or physical commitments find ways to justify that they're still right. Um, and a common way is to say, well, it was a test of our faith. Uh, and so we were so faithful that God has given us another few months. And then they'll go away and do their calculations again and say, yes, it, it's not May the 21st, it's November the 15th. People who are on the periphery of the cult, who haven't made the same degree of commitment, um, often go, oh my God, how embarrassing, and drift away. But the core tend to double down. Now, um, when we were at British Antarctic Survey, we, we had um, an interesting experience where um, uh, we had visiting groups of, uh, of business people who were given tours. And one of the um, uh, stops was in the ice core store, which is minus 15 degrees, it's vaulted, you know, the whole story about the ice cores is very impressive. It's delivered by usually a young scientist who, you know, is, is very credible. Um, they're allowed to, you know, you'll slice off a piece of, I don't know, 500,000 year old ice. You can hear the bubbles of air popping and so on. And on several occasions, we had a person who had been a, you know, dismisser flip over and have an epiphany, like a, a laying of the hands or a touching of the cloth, to the point where we were quite worried about it because. You know, we were releasing some deep psychological power um, that uh, we, we weren't in control of. Um, so we even you know, discussed whether we should do it. In the end, we said, well, you know, yes. Um, but uh, um, but, but so, so I doubt whether that person was totally committed in the way that a cult would be, but they were pretty committed. And that, ex that multi-sensory experience flipped them over. And in fact, um, Cambridge being what it was, I was sitting at a dinner next to, as it turned out, the American archbishop responsible, Anglican uh, archbishop responsible for the theatre of the communion and told him this story. And I said, I thought it was because we were assaulting multiple senses. And he got very excited and said, yes, 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 smell is good, you need incense, uh, symbols of power, a crook, big hats, very helpful, Com <laughs> communal singing, a little bit of uh, fortified wine at the beginning. Then you hit them with the sermon. We've been doing this for a thousand years. We know what we're doing. <laughs> so, so, so it is part, you know, there are ways that you can manipulate, and I'm afraid it is manipulate people into a mindset, but it's very difficult. And my personal experience of dealing with people who are strongly dismissive is that it's, it, it, it's interesting because you learn a lot about what's going on in their heads, but the true answer to what could I tell you that would shift your position is nothing that they're not in the game of shifting their position. So there will be a hardcore you can never shift, it seems to me. Um, brands, terrific question. Um, about 10 years ago, a bunch of um, very successful uh, marketeers in the UK put, came together as a group, uh, and I, I think it was, they called themselves the, the, the most difficult brief or something like that. Um, they... they uh, were feeling full of self-loathing, I think. They, they, they characterized themselves as landfill accelerators. Or full... Anyway, um, so they wanted to pay something back to society, and so they tried to use their talents to form messages and an approach to deliver something useful. They're, uh, they're a bit ahead of their time, and it didn't really go anywhere. But an, an, another um, marketeer who I talked to 
uh, when he listened to what we're up to, said, ah, yes, he said, so what base instinct are you looking to, uh, <laughs> to uh, accelerate or to light up? So the, the, there's, there's something out there, but as soon as you start to talk about framing, marketing techniques, my scientific colleagues get very nervous about the ethics of manipulation and, and so on. Um, and so it's, it's not an easy area, but it's certainly an area that, uh, is, is, that we're looking at. Framing is particularly important. How you frame something really affects how people react. And then Greenpeace, a uh, gentleman over here. Um, to, be, to be honest, um, I, 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 I don't think I'm really in a, in a position to say. I've tended to stand back from activism because I'm a natural scientist and that's what's been inculcated deeply in me. And so even to be seen to be too associated with the activist groups is something that we, we try and avoid. My impression is that um, after going through some uh, kind of difficult exploratory um, uh, periods, you know, 10, 20 years ago, um, they've backed off a little bit. And, and I know that they've been working with people who understand human values to try and see how they can get out of their value silo of, of the group of people who would naturally um, associate and sympathize with them uh, to society more, more generally. Uh, so they're definitely out there. They've definitely done some good. They've definitely done some bad. They put people off, um, you know, angered people who, who believe that they're, um, you know, recklessly, uh, well, you know, the sort of uh, view that, that people will have. So it's a bit of a curate's egg, actually. And, and, I don't know enough about them to really give you a definitive answer, but that's my general impression. Other questions? Um, hi, I'm from Plans Associates. I've finished a history degree at Exeter. I wondered what you thought about, you touched briefly on the idea of individual desires shifting political change. And I wondered what you thought about the idea of using, of tapping into that selfish instinct of economic value of of the climate and whether or not that's the way to go about it by making sustainability an, an economic yeah. issue. That's Good question, it. yes. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm a master's student in the psychological behavioral sciences department here. Um, I wanted to ask, I really appreciated how you uh, spoke like of bringing science and art together as a platform of intervention. And, um, but I was thinking a lot of people who would go to see a play like 2071 or who would go to a science museum or people who are more well off, people who are already like in the know, what would be other ways to like capitalize on that storytelling narrative that humans are so prone to be a part of and receptive to? where places that that would be a good place okay. to do that. Yeah, thank you. Question, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Harry. I work for the Environment Agency. Um, so going back to the Acerovitz diagram, how many people, or what percentage of people do you think you need over to the left-hand side? Wow. And do you think you've got the time to do that, to step them to the left? Three excellent questions, really good questions, thank you. Um, the economics, yes, I mean, the markets are already uh, uh, having a fantastic effect in the sense that um, India cancelled 23 uh, coal-fired power stations, uh, the contracts for them uh, last year because solar PV is now um, cost competitive uh, even without subsidy. Um, and you know the cost of um, uh, offshore wind has tumbled so that um, it's highly cost competitive as well. And if only we could stop uh, the, the hidden and other subsidies that go into uh, the fossil fuel industry, um, you would see that accelerate. And it's interesting that all of the projections of the penetration of green technology, energy technology and uh, vehicle technology, tend to be kind of quasi-linear or, or whatever. If, if, if some of those things begin to become exponential because the markets really bite, um, then the world could transform very quickly indeed. Our, our heads are very, very poor at understanding what happens with the exponentials. You know, the old story of the, the fisherman on the lake, uh, on, you know, the 29th day, only half of it is covered with lily pads, so they're not worried. And then the next day, the whole lake is covered with lily pads. So if we can get exponential growth through market forces, um, and, and of course, what we're also seeing is uh, it, it was very rare five years ago that I would get rung up by a pension fund 
um, but it happens a lot these days. And so, for example, CalPERS, the um, Californian pension fund, which invests $2 trillion a year, um, has put together a very powerful team to attempt to avoid uh, stranded assets and carbon bubbles uh, in their investments. Um, and you, you see that happening uh, a lot. Um, so, and then the other side is that not just the economics, but the law. In British law and, uh, and uh, elsewhere around the world, there is a, um, uh, a, a, a concept of uh, reasonable foreseeability. Uh, so if you as a shareholder uh, find that your holdings are losing value, um, and you reckon that that was reasonably foreseeable on the basis of the evidence that climate change is happening and what its consequences are, uh, then the law will begin to kick in and, and that will have a very powerful influence. So there are a number of ways that um, other institutions in society will be very powerfully help. And although I'm not particularly promoting it, you will see a lot of discussion of the use of a carbon tax, you know, stop income tax, but gather tax through a carbon tax. So people have all the money that they earn, uh, but a flight to Ibiza is going to cost them £2,000. Um, so, they, you know, they can still do it, uh, but it's their choice. But there's a, there's a big um, disincentive to do carbon-intensive uh, activities. So, yes, that's and, and there's, there's movement in that direction. It's not fast enough, um, but it's very, very good. Um, art and how, how the arts might help there have been lots of it. There was a, an organization called Tipping Point, still is. Uh, David Buckland did his uh, Cape Farewell stuff. Um, you know, there have been lots of attempts to get to a different audience, uh, almost, you know, under their radars by getting them to go and see some spectacular thing and a message uh, is delivered at the same time. Uh, it, it, there, there have been some disasters um, uh, because there is a danger that it becomes preachy and, and um, worthy, and people are very quick to feel that that's, you know, that they're being manipulated. You know, don't tell me what to think uh, is a very powerful reaction. So or, although it's, uh, it, I, th I think it opens up um, conversations, it opens up ways of discussing uh, the, the issue, I haven't yet seen um, many examples that lead to action uh, it, it interests people, it engages them. You might get a dinner conversation about it, but does it actually move people to action? And, and what I've come to realise is that we have spent so much time trying to get people to understand something when actually we want them to do something. And, and, and it's short-circuiting that stuff. So I'm not 100% convinced that the arts stuff is, is helping us as much as one might hope in that sense. Um, and then, oh, how many people? Uh, yes, uh, do we need to shift? A yeah, very good point. Um, it, 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 you know, inconvenienced elites are very powerful forces in society. Um, you know, the, the great stink uh, when, when the Thames was so fetid uh, with uh, sewage that Parliament couldn't meet. It didn't matter, you know, what people in Bermondsey were having to put up with. But when Parliament couldn't meet then all of a sudden it became something that was acted upon and the, um, a, a structure was put in place uh, which allowed a, a legal approach to putting sanitation across London and then the Victorian engineers were able to do what they were perfectly capable of doing all along, put in a, a superb sewage system so that the Thames cleaned up. So, and, and it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, Hurricane Sandy that hit New York and nearly brought down the, uh, art the art insurance market because it turned out that everybody had their fake Picasso in their loft and the real one was in a warehouse on low-lying land which got flooded. Um, so the, 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 the art insurance market more or less went under with huge um, losses. Um, so when, when elites were inconvenienced, all of a sudden there was massive action. So there's an enormous action in New York. Um, to deal with rising sea levels and climate change, but you don't see the same thing happening in the poor parts of New Orleans. So inconvenienced elites are, are, are crucial. So you certainly don't have to have everybody over on that right-hand side, but you need to get key people over there, and you need to have enough of everybody else that they don't block stuff. So there's just one quick example in Rotterdam, and I've never quite got to the bottom of how far this is a physical entity, um, but a coal burning or coke burning um, power station was built, which was the most um, 
thermodynamically and economically viable example of a carbon capture and storage, so a clean coal, if you like, uh, uh, thing that's going to pump liquid CO2 out into a, an old um, uh, redundant uh, oil uh, formation in the North Sea. And it was uh, funded uh, by the EU at vast cost and by the Dutch government. Um, and it, it was, as I understand it, extremely well designed, very well planned. But nobody thought to discuss it with the citizens of Rotterdam. And when they heard about it, they said, we don't want liquid CO2 pumped underneath us. What if it leaks out, suffocates us or explodes? Um, it didn't help that the PowerPoint that showed it, it seemed to be about two feet under their lawns, whereas, in fact, it was probably a lot lower. So, if, so you've got to have enough people on side. You need some people to drive it, but you've got other people to accept it. But, oh, because what happened there was a citizen, a very uh, active citizens group formed, uh, and they've blocked it. So the whole thing is stalled now. I think, I think we've run out. I think, okay. sadly, uh, that we've run out of time. Um, I don't really know what to say, Chris. Uh, there's a huge amount there to think about particularly on the psychological side, dialogue as opposed to debate. But changing who we are, wow. Uh, that's, uh, that's a tall order in a short time. But anyhow, I think, uh, I hope that you've enjoyed the talk as much as I have, and I hope you come back again, Chris, and give us another talk, and uh, a show of appreciation for a super, super talk. <laughs>